Hi, everyone, and welcome to the virtual planetarium from the Museum of Science. Uh, my name is Emily. My pronouns are she and her, and I will be your moderator during this program. So that basically means that if you are watching us on Zoom, I am the person watching the Q&A box. So if you have a question throughout the program or a comment, feel free to drop it in that Q&A box just by clicking on the Q&A button that you see on your screen and then typing in your question. Now, we also offer, offer um, captions during this program. So if you would like to see captions, you can click on the CC button on your screen and then select show subtitles. So with that, I'm going to have our uh, lead educators come on screen and we'll get started. Hello, everybody. My name is Talia. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm going to be your educator today, um, but I can't do this alone. Hi, everyone. My name is Katie. My pronouns are she and her, and today I will be providing the visuals. And we are continuing Space Station Month here uh, on Virtual Planetarium. And we've talked about the first Russian space station, Salyut. We talked about the first American space station, Skylab. And now we're gonna we're here to talk about the next step in sort of space station evolution. And that was Mir, uh, the Russian space station. This space station uh, was really a big step forward in terms of space station engineering. It was the first space station that was designed to grow. Uh, first totally modular space station designed to grow, designed to update, designed to change over time. It set records for uh, continuous habitation in space that would not be matched until the International Space Station. Uh, it was the first real long-term international cooperation in space up to now. International cooperation in space really was for very brief missions. This was a long-term international cooperation uh, in the second part of Mir's existence. And this is appropriate because Mir means peace and also maybe world. Maybe if there's anybody in the audience who speaks Russian, they can clarify that. And uh, it also had a very eventful life. So let's talk about some of the basics about this space station. Uh, its pressurized volume was about 350 cubic meters. So now about 350 cubic meters of internal space in which the astronauts and cosmonauts can move around. This made it way bigger than the Salyut space stations, which up to this point had been uh, what Russia was using, which had about 90 cubic meters of space inside. It is, however, way smaller than the International Space Station, which has about a thousand cubic meters of space inside of it. Uh, it is actually about, it was about the same amount of internal pressurized area as uh, the American Space Station Skylab. So they had about a, the same amount of internal space. Its first module launched in 1986. So uh, that's when it began. It, uh, was crewed periodically from 1986 through April of 89. There were periods during that time where there was nobody on the space station. But then it was continuously crewed, continuously had people on board from September 1989 through August of 1999. That is a 10-year run, uh, which would not be matched until eventually the space station was able to match it in 2010. And the record for the longest single flight in space, the longest single amount of time that a person has spent in space at one time still is held uh, by somebody who was visiting Mir at the time. Uh, cosmonaut Valery Polyakov spent 437 days and 18 hours aboard Mir from January of 94 to March of 95. And that has not come close to being broken by anything on the space station. Now this space station was originally, uh, Mir was originally supposed to last for five years. So its first module went up in 86. It was supposed to only last until about 91. It wound up lasting 15 years and was deorbited in 2001. Uh, so when it was originally approved for um, development in 1976. So it took 10 years from approval through um, the first module launching the core module. And it actually allowed a lot of the lessons that were learned during the Salyut series of space stations to be put into use. Uh, 
So the first module of MIR, the core module, which is what you see here, was actually a solute. It's basically a solute module. Uh, the same thing that was the entire space station back in the solute days served as the core module on Mir, and that launched in February of 86. And then this space station grew over time over the next 10 years. So it, the, and another, the next module was Kvant 1, which was launched in 87, then Kvant 2 launched in 89, Crystal or Crystal. I don't speak Russian, I'm afraid, uh, launched in 1990. And there was a little bit of a gap before the launch of Spectre in 1995 and Proroda in 1996, uh, which was the final module to be added leading to the completed space station. And as you can see, this whole thing was powered by massive solar arrays, um, which is gonna become important a little bit later. So, I said Mir had roughly the same amount of space inside as Skylab, but they're constructed very differently. If you remember from Katie's talk last week, Skylab was one giant module with a bunch of empty space in the middle of it. So Skylab was 350 meter, cubic meters of pressurized volume in one big module. With Mir, that space was spread out over many, many modules, and it actually meant that the inside of Mir was very tight. It was very cramped. Uh, so these are photos of um, the top picture there. That is Canadian astronaut Chris Hadfield um, trying to make his way through a hatch amongst a whole lot of debris. And bottom left, that is ast US astronaut Shannon Lucid. Uh, sort of floating amongst near another hatch uh, with a lot of stuff in it. And this uh, space station kept accumulating more detritus as it aged. Again, this thing was only supposed to last five years and it stayed up for 15. Now, one thing I really want you guys to note about these pictures is these are all photos of hatches. So all of those round portals, those are all hatches. I want you all to make note of all the stuff that is running through the hatches all of the cables, those huge tubes of stuff. Every hatch on Mir has a whole bunch of materials running through it, cables, um, power cords, and these big tubes. That's going to become relevant a little bit later. Mir was designed to regularly house up to three, so it was supposed to only have a crew of three. However, uh, during crew swapovers, it could occasionally house up to six people for short durations. So um, from time to time, it would have more people aboard. And uh, over the course of its life, it uh, got dirtier and dirtier. Uh, NASA astronauts who would go on to visit Mir in the second part of its life did report that the station was starting to look really, really run down. And before it deorbited, they actually uh, took some panels, some um, instruments off and looked at the panels underneath uh, and they sampled what they found there and they realized that Mir had a major mold problem. By the time it deorbited, it had a major mold problem. Uh, and lessons from this would then be used to help maintain a cleaner environment aboard the International Space Station. So this space station, uh, Mir, really is the beginning, as I said, of international cooperation in space, which is now fairly standard um, aboard the ISS, but this was new. And over its life, Mir hosted astronauts from Syria, Bulgaria, Afghanistan, France, the United Kingdom, Austria, Germany, Slovakia, the United States, Japan, and Canada. So this was the first time, uh, you know, they started to experiment with this on some of the Solute stations with letting, um, cosmonauts from Soviet bloc countries come aboard the Salyut stations. Mir is where it really opened up and started including the rest of the world. And uh, the big cooperation, the big partnership on Mir was actually between Russia and the United States. And that came about because in the later part of the 1980s, uh, both Russia, which at the time was the Soviet Union, 
and the United States had really big space station plans. The U.S. hadn't had a space station since Skylab deorbited. They had, NASA had plans for a big new shiny space station that they were going to call Freedom. And not to be outdone, the Soviet space agency was preparing a successor to Mir that was going to be called Mir 2, bigger, better, shinier, etc. However, uh, budget constraints meant freedom never got built. So the US never, never again built a space station all by itself the way it had with Skylab. And the uh, collapse of the Soviet Union meant that there was going to be no Mir 2, which means Mir was it. It was the only game in town. It was the only space station at that point. So one of the uh, modules on Mir was Crystal or Crystal, and it carried a, a, a place for a docking port that was originally supposed to be used for this thing that you see on the right. You might assume, hey, that's the space shuttle. I've seen that before, but this is not. NASA's space shuttle. This is a Russian space shuttle called Buran, which never flew in space. This program was to, went very far into development. You can see they actually had uh, an orbiter built, but it never flew into space. And the space for the docking port on Crystal was meant for that. It was meant for Buran to be able to dock with Mir. Once Baran was done, that project was done and Baran was grounded, well, there was an empty space for a shuttle docking port on Mir. Who at the time had a space shuttle? The US, NASA had a space shuttle. So in June of 1992, uh, you, the US and Russia agreed to start cooperating in space, which is a major, this was a huge deal. These two countries really had been adversaries in space for so long and then sort of uneasy like frenemies in space and now they were going to officially cooperate and in 1993 they announced the shuttle mir program this is going this allowed uh, the space shuttle to dock with mir this is the space shuttle atlantis docking with the mir space station and it allowed for astronauts to serve, US astronauts to serve rotations aboard Mir, just like the cosmonauts did. So in 1995, Atlantis attached a NASA docking port to Crystal, and that allowed uh, over from 1994 to 1998, 11 space shuttle missions to dock at Mir. And seven NASA astronauts were able to serve aboard Mir alongside their uh, Russian counterparts. Now, before we go, I'm going about to talk to uh, uh, mention some notable moments that notable events that happened throughout Mir's history. Uh, but before we go into that, Emily, have any questions popped up so far? I do have one. Um, but first, I just want to say that what you said about the mold buildup in Mir is horrifying. Yeah. I like that tidbit. No. Um, so Rob in Lakeville has a question and they're wondering why did the Russians give up on supporting Mir? And I wonder if that came in when you were talking about Mir being deorbited. Uh, that will come up when I start to talk about Mir being deorbited. Okay, perfect. So stay tuned, Rob from Lakeville. <laughs> so that's the only thing that has come into the Q&A box so far. So I think it's good to move on. Excellent. So let's talk about, I mentioned that a lot of stuff happened over the course of Mir's lifetime. It had a very eventful life, which is not necessarily a good thing. You kind of hope that your space station is going to be boring and isn't going to have any surprises to deal with. That was very much not the case with Mir. It had um, a lot of things happen. And these involved both things that happened in space and things that happened on the ground. So for instance, uh, when Soyuz TM-13 launched for Mir, which it did in October of 1991, it carried, it was carrying cosmonauts and there were a couple of uh, cosmonauts already aboard Mir at the time. All of those cosmonauts were citizens of the Soviet Union and their spacecraft launched from the Kazakh Soviet Socialist Republic. Uh, which was part of the Soviet Union. 
while they were up there, when the so things changed, and by the time those cosmonauts landed, they were no longer citizens of the Soviet Union, they were citizens of the Russian Federation. And their spacecraft did not land in the Kazakh Soviet Socialist Republic, it landed in the Republic of Kazakhstan, because the final dissolution of the Soviet Union occurred in December of 1991 while these men were still in space. Uh, so that actually meant, meant that uh, they called these cosmonauts the last Soviets. They were the last of, the, uh, because they were the last Soviet citizens to become officially Russian citizens because they were in space at the time. Now this actually did add some complications to how Russia operated its space program because it was no longer officially launching from Russian soil. And to this day, Russia's launches happen in Kazakhstan. Uh, and also they're, uh, they have to um, have ships in the Black Sea around Ukraine in order to safely monitor launches and landings. That was fine when Ukraine was part of the USSR, it is no longer fine. So this actually set up several complications for how Russia continues to this day to operate its space agency, which is now called Roscosmos. So then let me tell you the story of two kind of unfortunate cosmonauts, uh, Vasily Sibliev and Alexander Lazutkin, seen here in the photo with uh, US astronaut Jerry Lininger. These guys had a very bad run of luck on Mir. They launched in February, nine, uh, February 10th, 1997 to Mir. And they, it was the two of them and a German astronaut who was basically just along for the ride. What they were gonna do is they were gonna go up, uh, the three of them, they were gonna join the two cosmonauts who were already on the space station with Jerry Lininger. And after a little while, the two cosmonauts who were already up there were going to depart with the German astronaut and leave Sibliev and Lazutkin with Lininger. So before that happened, while the uh, there's six of them were still up there, Mir had a bad day. Uh, so when there were six astronauts or cosmonauts aboard Mir, they actually, because the station was only rated for three of them, uh, they had to use backup oxygen and fuel canisters to make sure that the station could successfully support all six occupants. So again, they launched on February 10th. On February 23rd, while all six of these guys were still up on the space station, a backup fuel canister in Kvant, one of these backup canisters, caught fire. Now, fire is like the worst thing that can happen to a space station, pretty much. Uh, and this thing started spewing molten metal into the air. The station filled with smoke. And there was actually concern, they were worried because there was molten metal, they were worried that this fire was melting through the hull. Uh, it wound up burning for about 14 minutes, which is a nightmarish amount of time if you're stuck on a space station on fire, as was Jerry Lininger, who we see here wearing an oxygen mask. Uh, and the station was almost evacuated. However, I've read Jerry Lininger's book, Off the Planet, by the way, it's a great book if you feel like reading uh, an astronaut story about Mir. Uh, he says that the smoke was so bad that they were not, there was one of the Soyuz capsules they were probably not going to be able to get to, which would have meant only half of them would have been able to evacuate. Uh, in the end, they got the, the fire burned out. Uh, the crew had to spend several days wearing uh, oxygen masks. Lininger later developed lung issues, which he suspects might be from this fire, but the fire itself did not cause any long-term damage to the space station. So Lininger's time aboard ended in May. The space shuttle uh, docked. It took Lininger off the space station and left astronaut, British US astronaut Mike Fole in his place. So now uh, Sibliev and Lazutkin were up there with a different guy, a different American, uh, Mike Fole. And in June, uh, there was a, a another really bad day. So this is a Progress spacecraft. Progress is um, a cargo spacecraft. To this day, it is still used for uh, delivering cargo to the International Space Station. Um, it looks an awful lot like a Russian Soyuz capsule, but it is a no 
people are not designed. It, it was not designed to carry people. This is designed to carry cargo. And it was using an experimental docking procedure, brand new docking procedure to try and get it to dock with Mir. And it went very badly. Uh, the, it missed the docking port. It crashed into a solar array and then it ricocheted off of the Spectre module, which is one of those, one of the end modules on this, on Mir. This is the solar array after it had uh, a high speed impact with the progress module. It's actually in pretty intact, which is impressive because it got hit by a flying spacecraft. And it did a little better. I mean, it's mostly still intact when the cargo vehicle ricocheted off of Spectre the at residents aboard Mir felt the exact thing that no astronaut or cosmonaut ever wants to feel. They felt a pressure difference in their ears. Pressure differences aboard the space station means you've got a leak. It means air is leaking out. The cargo vehicle hit Spectre so hard that it punctured the hull. And Spectre was decompressing, releasing space station air out into space. So when that happened, they, there's hatches, of course, between all of these modules because they were once their own spacecraft. But remember that photo from earlier with all of the cables and tubes and everything running through the hatches? That was the case for the Spectre mo module. They couldn't just close the hatch. So uh, basically what happened is Lazutkin and Fole had to immediately start disconnecting cables while air is leaking out of the space station. Two of the cables they had to hack out with a knife to disconnect them. And they were able to get the hatch closed and sealed, which saved the rest of the air in the space station. But they had also just disconnected a bunch of power cables. And as you can see, Spectre has a bunch of the solar panels on it. That's a huge piece of the space station's power that they just chopped off. The station only had 40% power and the impact had sent it spinning. This is when uh, the residents aboard had to use some serious ingenuity. They had to eyeball the measurements of star positions to stop the tumble. And then they had to use the engines of their Soyuz capsule, which was attached to Mir, to get the solar panels facing towards the sun again so that they could continue to generate power. This incident also led to kind of a very unusual situation, cosmonauts and astronauts having to do IVAs. You may have heard of EVAs, extra vehicular activities or spacewalks. An IVA is an intravehicular uh, activity. It's basically, they had to do a spacewalk inside of Spectre because they had to reconnect some of those power cables to get power to the rest of the space station. And that was the end of Spectre as a usable module. It remained closed off, decompressed, and unusable for the rest of Mir's life. In the midst of all this, Siblio started having heart trouble. <laughs> you kind of can't blame him. Uh, and he basically had to be told to take it easy because they were worried about him suffering um, a major cardiac event in space. Now, this uh, was actually only one of several instances where the station wound up losing power and starting to tumble. And Foles' experience during all of this uh, actually almost led to the end of the shuttle Mir program. They almost canceled it because NASA was not necessarily thrilled about, you know, Jerry Linninger getting caught in a fire and Mike Full having to deal with a decompressing spacecraft. They were worried about the risks to their astronauts. Uh, it did ultimately continue two more astronauts after full would go on to serve long-term missions on Mir. So Rob from Florida, you wanted to know why Roscosmos stopped financially supporting Mir, the Mir space station. It had to do with the next space station, the ISS, which was always sort of meant to be the end game of the shuttle Mir program that was supposed to start the two space agencies cooperating so that they could build this giant station, International Space Station in space. But once those modules began to launch in 1998, it became too expensive for Roscosmos to both continue to build modules for the International Space Station and keep funding Mir. So although Mir was still functioning, they decided to bring it down while it was still functioning so that they could control the reentry. Unlike the last two space stations, Solute 7 and Skylab, which both made uncontrolled re-entries, one over Australia, one over Argentina, and wound up littering the landscape with pieces of themselves, Skylab was able to make a controlled re-entry. 
The last crew left, I'm sorry, Mir was able to make a totally controlled re-entry. The last crew left in June of 2000. Uh, and in March, 2001, Mir uh, entered the atmosphere. It broke apart and it burned up over the South Pacific in a very uninhabited area, which is known as the spacecraft graveyard because that's where you want your spacecraft to re-enter. It's a place where there's almost no possibility of um, damage to humans or even islands, uh, uninhabited islands. There's nothing in that part of the Pacific. So they call it the spacecraft graveyard. That's where Mir came down. I actually remember Taco Bell had a said they said that they towed a giant target into the ocean and was gonna give everybody in America a free taco if it hit the target. Uh, I don't know actually, we know where the target was, it did not was nowhere near where Mir came down. So if you want to talk about Mir's legacy, it was the first truly great space station. It was the first fully modular space station. It was up there for 15 years. ISS has passed that at this point, but at the time that was unimaginable. Uh, and it really standardized the idea of international cooperation in space. And if you don't have Mir, you do not get the International Space Station. And even going forward, uh, future projects such as uh, the Gateway Space Station, which we're hoping to build around the moon, that is going to also be an international um, collaboration. And it all really comes back and has its seeds in, in Mir. Uh, so it's not a bad legacy for a space station to have. All right, Emily, have any more questions come in? I have not seen any more questions. Awesome. You definitely had me on the edge of my seat during those horror stories. So scary. Well, yeah, I, I, we like to sort of think of space travel as being easy, but uh, if you've, you've got a space station, you've got to maintain it and you've got to design it well, build it well and maintain it well. Uh, and Mir over the course of its life just sort of didn't have what it needed to stay in good shape and stuff happened. Too bad. So uh, folks, we're officially out of time. Um, Talia and Katie, do you wanna say goodbye and also tell us what you're talking about next Tuesday? Hi everyone. And I'm gonna be talking about the Tiangong one and two space stations next week. We're gonna be talking about the Chinese space stations. We're gonna be ending the week, ending the month with the obvious topic for space station month. We will be talking about the International Space Station at the end of the month. Thank you, ladies. All right. So folks, let me share my screen for a moment. Thank you so much for joining us uh, this week and every week. Um, we do this every single Tuesday until October. So you can keep that in mind. If you want to see any more of our virtual offerings, you can visit mos.org slash mos at home. And then if you would like to um, contribute to the museum, you can visit engage.mos.org slash welcome. So I hope we'll see you all next Tuesday and have a great week until then. Bye. <laughs>